Welcome everyone and thank you for joining. This is Laura Allegue, one of the course leads here at the MIT CTL for the MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management program. I'm very happy to be co-hosting this live event with Mr. Kellen Betts. Hi, Kellen. Also a course lead here at the program. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Christopher Mejia joining us today. Chris Mejia holds many hats here at the center. He serves as the director of the MIT Scale Network for Latin America and the Caribbean. He is the director of the MIT Graduate Certificate in Logistics and Supply Chain Management, the one we call GISLOG, and that is one of the pathway for our MicroMasters in SEM program. And he's joining us today with his research hat as the founder and director of the Food and Retail Operations Lab. Welcome, Chris, and thank you for joining here and our audience today. Well, thank you very much for having me, guys. So it's a, a real pleasure for me to be with you today. Okay, so awesome. should I so get us? I'll, I'll launch a brief poll and we go through the agenda for the okay. session. Uh, so if Lisa here from Coms can help us, thank you, Lisa, for being here today. Uh, we want to know why you're here today joining us. So the first could be if that you're actually joined for network design, because we know many here are uh, on that course right now. Are you here to learn more about AI applications in the supply chain, social sustainability, um, generally expanding the supply chain knowledge, uh, or just getting a lot of analytical skills and willing to know where to apply them? So thank you for that. While we populate this poll, Kellen will share the agenda for the session. Well, thank you, Lara, and welcome, Chris. Pleasure to have you here today. So for the next 20 minutes or so, Dr. Mejia, Chris, um, will be discussing recent work in the food and retail operations lab he's been working on. We're very excited to bring him in and hear some about recent research um, that they've been working on, specifically about increasing efficiency in food supply chains to improve access to quality nutrition, um, especially in underserved communities around the world. And so we're very excited to, to have this discussion today. And Laura and I will have some kind of questions pre-prepared for after the, the presentation. We'll focus on those for a few minutes, but we definitely will save some time for your questions there in the audience, you out there. And so please start thinking of those as we progress along in our presentation or Chris's presentation. And please use that Q&A feature there in Zoom, that Q&A button up there along the bottom to ask your questions. We'll, we'll definitely keep track of the Q&A. It's hard for us to keep track of questions in the chat because there's lots of other comments in the chat. So please use that. Q&A feature and be sure it'll be logged in. We won't pick anonymous questions. Um, so with that, maybe let's check on our results from our first poll here. If we could end that poll and then see the results here. So the question was, why are you here today? Um, I think lots of learners, obviously, um, that's awesome. Lots of see learners here looking to um, learn about network design as real world applications. So that's great. That seems to be one of the more popular ones. Also, I want to learn about AI applications in supply chain. So that's also awesome as well. I know we have lots of SC4X learners out there where we're studying machine learning and AI. Um, so hopefully we'll touch on some AI concepts. And Chris, I don't know if you have any thoughts about the poll results there. Well, this is quite varied, right? So I will try to, you know, like to address uh, most of them, but well, probably a few of them are not going to be necessarily with too much depth, but I'm sure that with your help and the other, you know, like live events that you will have, you can expand a little bit further. Awesome. Well, with that in mind, do you want to kick things off and, and take over here, Chris, and Absolutely. start your presentation? Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, as I was telling you, thank you for having me, guys. So let me start sharing like the presentation mode so it should be working probably right now so um well hey everyone i i really hope that you are going to enjoy this so hopefully you can provide also feedback at, at the end of all of this part so let me start by telling you some interesting figures to get started the world in the previous years as a food system produced or has produced around 11 billion tons of food per year imagine that and this space was maintained during the pandemic but the, the supply chains have been super resilient. And something that has helped a lot is the supply chain network design behind all of them. And today I'm gonna be discussing another type of supply chain network design that is social driven because we want to bring nutrition uh, to the people who need the most by using similar techniques like the ones that you have learned or you are learning at the SC2X or at the SC4X, okay? So uh, as you will see, most of my dissertation today is focused on social driven supply chain network design, bringing nutrition through all of these AI components to underserved communities. And this is a work that I typically do with many colleagues. In this case, I had the opportunity to collaborate with an SEM master's student, the PhD candidate nowadays, 
Sanchita Das, who is studying her PhD at the University of Washington uh, on, the other, on the other coast, and also with my colleague Tatiana Sadala, who is a nutritionist by training. Well, anyways, let's start this journey, okay? So to get started, what is the Food and Retail Operations Lab, or what does it exist? So in, in short, so we can speak uh, about many different food issues around the world, food malnutrition, food insecurity, uh, food waste, etc. But if you think about it, this is a, a multidisciplinary problem and that is addressed by supply chain managers like us that we are studying this, uh, by economists and also social scientists because they really need to understand what is going on with the price and everything else, right? So if the price is not proper, food is not affordable and the rest of the supply chain is gonna fail. Innovation sciences, because you need to make sure to create some kind of awareness, kind of a tool, a technology that can help, you know, like bringing more people to, to, to these uh, vulnerable population segments. And health sciences, because it's everything about nutrition, right? So you are not uh, taking proper food, this is not gonna work properly. But the Food and Retail Operations Lab works in these five dimensions that you see at the center. So first, we want to address everything related to combat food malnutrition of any kind. Food malnutrition is a wide word, but basically involves or comprises food insecurity, uh, obesity, and overweight. So naturally, this is related to nutrients, and you need to make sure that we bring proper food to all the population segments. Second, we want to reduce food waste and food losses through circular economy approaches and many other innovative schemes. Then we need to make sure that this food is edible and has the quality that we need in order to eat it. That's called food safety, okay? That is different from, for, from security because food safety is more related to reducing any kind of breaches because there is a cross-contamination, for instance. And the uh, previous to last component is how you connect the smallholder farmers to the rest of the ecosystem. And this is part of what we're gonna be talking today. How do you connect the smallholder farmers locally to combat food malnutrition, okay? And the long-term, let's say, uh, next frontier that we have for the lab is how we can transform this into long-term sustainable food ecosystems through logistics, okay? With all the different strategies, operations, understanding human behavior, the technology as a driver, and to provide proper governance, okay? So this is a few of the countries that we are working at with different projects, but that's something that I'm not gonna elaborate too much today. But first, I want to really make you think about the following. And by the way, I'm gonna be using something that probably you will learn in SC3X that is actually a system dynamics, okay? So you haven't taken that course, well, bear with me, okay? I'm gonna make it uh, you know, like easy for you to understand. Right? But why are food supply chains so important? So let's take one specific issue in the world, food malnutrition, okay? I already mentioned food insecurity, overweight, or um, <clears throat> uh, any kind of form like that, okay? So if we try to relate food malnutrition to economic growth, so we can create some kind of a polarity. So as you can imagine, higher the food malnutrition, what do you think is gonna happen to the economic growth? It's gonna be lower, right? And then if we relate this to productivity at work, higher the economic growth, higher the productivity at work. If we want to relate this as a person impact in the rest of the ecosystem, we need to understand the country's performance, the country's economic performance. So higher the productivity at work, higher the, country, the country's performance uh, in the economics, right? And then we can continue adding poverty rates. So if you have, and probably it's better if I use like the laser pointer here for you guys, higher the country's economic performance, lower the, po the poverty rates, right? But higher the poverty rates, oops, sorry, higher the food malnutrition. So if you remember from if you remember from your elementary school or your arithmetic classes, you can multiply the polarities and then you will get a sign that is positive, right? Minus plus uh, multiple uh, times plus times plus times plus, uh, times minus times plus is positive sign, right? So this is a reinforcing loop. This means that it will grow without control, and this means that the malnutrition will put the brakes on the economic growth. And we can do exactly the same to understand any other type of problem here. You can call this like uh, poverty. You can call this like food waste, you know? And this is creating an issue at the economic level. But guess what? The same happens to social part, the social development. It's also an issue and we can create similar polarities and then we will find another reinforcing loop that is called social backwardness. And we can do the same if we think about our own health, right? 
So, and if we speak about our own health, it's another reinforcing loop, and this is the health burden. So in other words, food malnutrition is gonna be impacting the economic growth of a country, the social development of the country, and the health of the whole country. And as we know, education is in between the economic growth, the social development, the health, and the productivity. Therefore, this is very impactful. We need to make sure that we are eating properly. That's one of the reasons why. But now let's start talking about other things uh, because unfortunately this is creating wrong dynamics. It's kind of a vicious circle that we experience here because the more that we start eating wrongly or other types of goods that are not necessarily providing nutrition, the more that we are getting rid of these fruits and vegetables, perishable products that are bringing nutrition, nutrition to the neighborhoods. For instance, in this case, I'm gonna read this with the opposite sign, okay, but bear with me. So lower the fruit and vegetable affordability. So this means that you don't have enough money to buy these fruits and vegetables. There is gonna be lower demand, right? Lower the demand for these perishable products, lower the accessibility. Nobody will like to put them in the shelves or make them available, you know, in their corresponding shop, uh, uh, you know, like uh, stores, right? Higher, uh, sorry, lower the accessibility for fruits and vegetables, lower the demand, and lower the demand, lower the, the well, the affordability is gonna be also impacted, right? Because if somebody wants to sell them, they are gonna sell them at a very astronomic price. Therefore, this is not good. And this is typically what we call not only in developing countries, but also in the United States, food deserts, okay? This also happens, happens in the United States. And for the record here in the United States, with $5, we can buy 312 calories like this. So it's a, a bunch of grapes, two broccolis, and some orange juice there, right? But for the same amount of money, we can buy this quantity of calories. Are they nutritious or not? Well, that's something that I'm gonna leave on you, uh, leave on you. But naturally, we can improve it, right? We need to make it. We make sure that we are, you know, like getting proper nutrition to our body. But now let's start thinking about what is the undesired effect of all of this. For all the food that we are not necessarily consuming, all these tomatoes that we have at the fridge that we buy and we never eat because of several reasons, because we don't have the time to cook it, etc we are generating plenty of waste. In the United States, one of every two apples goes to waste. In Latin America and the Caribbean, one of every three apples goes to waste. And in the case of India, it's four out of every 10 apples goes to waste. And with the same quantity of this food waste that can be recovered, we can feed this quantity of people, 15 million inhabitants living in very poor conditions, in the case of the United States, 36 million in the case of Latin America and 12 million in the case of, of India, right? And remember that the third largest polluter in the world is actually food waste. So if we start recovering more food and making a difference, this whole ecosystem is gonna work better and benefit the environment too. I'm not gonna speak about like the last column here for the sake of time. But now let's start discussing about like the topic that we want to discuss today. So first, how many of you what is this? how many of you know what is this this is a superfood and it's called chia okay and there is another one this one is quinoa okay and the last one is called tarwi or andean chickpea as they will call it in in the in the united states and in english speaking countries well all of these ones are superfoods but how many of you guys know that some of these foods are not necessarily let's say palatable or accepted in some of the cultures some of these of the cultures wouldn't like to eat chia, quinoa, or actually tarwi because their religion or many other cultural issues are gonna be affecting. So all of this matters. And as you have learned probably, or hopefully uh, with all the micromasters, right now you know that what, who is at the end of the supply chain is the consumer. And if the consumer changes everything, everything is gonna be affected. So we need to make sure that everything supply chain network design and everything else is gonna be aligned with the rest that we are preparing, handling, distributing, okay? Well, what is the case of India? We know that for, uh, in this case, religious reasons, some uh, most of the times the beef is not eaten there, okay? Because the religion, the same happens with some of the pigs, the porks, right? So the vast majority of the uh, plate that they are eating every day is based on this, 50% fruits and vegetables, 10% is pulses, eggs, and other flesh foods, 4% is fats, oils, nuts, milk, and 23% is cereals, 
and other nutricidials. It's like uh, millets, okay? So as you can see, a vast majority of what they should eat is based on plant-based protein, right? But something that we discover, because at the end, we is that there is an eternal divorce between nutrition and operations research. If you remember what you learned in SC0X, or maybe you will learn it, it's a very good example of how to learn optimization, and it's called the, the diet problem. Is where you need to minimize the cost, and then you need to satisfy certain restrictions, larger or equal to something. Do you remember that? Well, let me tell you the following. In reality, our body doesn't behave like that. It's not like, oh, I need to eat three apples or because this is going to bring me like, I don't know, uh, 300 calories, and then I'm going to be able to absorb th these vitamins. It's not like that. Because once we cook the, the food or if we are sick, the way that our organism, our metabolism is going to be processing all of this is completely different, right? So we need to change the approach. And this is exactly what we did here. So... What we discovered while, while checking something that exists in, in India that is called the uh, public distribution system, that is a system that has uh, that was developed in the early 60s, in, uh, in 1960, they started, you know, like bringing mainly rice and wet to the population segments in order to start reducing the food malnutrition. But something that we discovered together with Sanchita is that it's a great effort, but in terms of cereals, they are bringing more, 51 kilos for a family of four when you actually need 32 kilos. And in the case of the pulses, that is the plant-based protein, they are only bringing 3.67 kilos, and then they need actually 10.8. So it's only 33%. So there is deficiency. So there is malnutrition, right? So all the project is about how we can bring more plant-based protein to all the population segments, especially the ones who need the most, right? And the research questions, because remember everything that we do at CTL is research oriented. So question number one, how we can design a healthy, affordable, locally sourced food combinations or food baskets that Indian households can buy? Second, how we distribute all of this? What type of supply chain network design we can model in order to make that happen? So, as part of the answers, what we want to solve is provide more available nutritious food at affordable prices, especially for the ones who need the most, and provide this accessibility to all of them, just to make sure that all the geographies across India, they have access to this at a proper price, uh, 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 and, and these are available to them. And well, within the scope, what we are modeling here is cereals and pulses. We haven't modeled yet fruits and vegetables. That's something that is coming. We are using only the public distribution system that is managed by the government. We are not changing that. And our main target is like the poorest segments of the population, okay? We are serving all of them, but we want to focus particularly on those. So the methodology, first, we wanted to segment all the customers because all of them are different. We consider the geography, where they are living, in what region, west, east, north, south, center, okay? Socioeconomic features, how much money they are earning? What is the average income level? What is the population density? What is like the historical consumption of different types of products? And this is the demand and the taste preference that is coming from an expenditure data, consumption expenditure data from the government. So, and based on that, we started using PCA and K-means clustering just to understand how these districts look like, okay? And how these clusters look like. Then, in the second part, once we characterize the customers, we want to characterize the food baskets, in this case, like the grain, the grain and cereal baskets. And what we want to make sure is that the assortment of each of these baskets is actually affordable, well, well assorted, and nutritious, also bringing a, a plant-based protein, you know? And for that, we use a bean packing algorithms to make sure that this is possible. It's similar to the NAXA problem. Do you remember that from the SC0X as well? So you want to put as many, you know, that nutrients in that knapsack, right? In this case, it's a bean, right? With other characteristics to make sure that you are bringing nutrition to that specific community or that specific district. And last but not least, well, what we want, what you wanted to hear. So what we want to make sure is that we are building a mixed integer linear programming that is multi-commodity and is handling these different types of cereals or baskets across the distribution network, okay? We want to make sure that we are counting for those storage locations that are like silos from the government, and we are bringing all of these to the to the hands of who really needs it. But in order to understand this a little bit better, it's probably easier if I show you 
what is like the steps that we follow. So a traditional farmer in India and in many other countries, right? They can decide if they want to sell these products directly uh, to the end consumers or they can sell them directly to the government. In this case, what we're gonna be paying attention to and what is part uh, within the scope is all what you see in this square, okay? So the farmer sells this to, uh, to the government and the government is gonna make sure to bring this to a collection center, a procurement center. And then from the procurement center, the government is gonna ship this to a storage center. It's kind of a, a, it's a coupling point in this case where they are gonna be bringing different types of products, particularly, I repeat, rice and wet, okay? And this, they are gonna be transporting this by road. And then once they go to this big silo, they are gonna be distributing this across India, you know, among different states by rail. And that's why the rail is very important in India in order to bring all of this nutrition to the ones who need the most. Because as you can imagine, well, as in any other country, the weather conditions are different in different states, right? In certain states are more arid than others, other ones are a little bit more humid. So we need to transport like this uh, food and life to the, to, the, to the population segments. And then, then this is receiving the other silo in one of the states, and then the distribution process starts. So from the silo, they are gonna bring this by road to the distribution center. And from the distribution center, the government is gonna develop these fair price shops where they are gonna be actually delivering this to the end consumers, okay? The model looks as follows, okay? So I'm not gonna deep dive for the sake of time of, on all of this, but I want to give you an idea that what we want to do is to minimize the cost for the government, including the procurement cost, because naturally this is not for free, yeah? Second, we need to minimize the storage cost and the handling cost. Every time that we are, you know, like passing this through different hands, you know, from the procurement center to the storage center, then to the storage center, to the storage center two or the other silo, and then to the distribution center, that is the decoupling point. Uh, we need to consider all of that. And of course, all the transportation, right? In between the different uh, facilities. Key parameters, the consumption that each of these families, households do, right? Or have. Um, how many households do we have per district? In India, the government has divided the, 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 the whole country in 625 districts, okay? For which they have a lot of very granular information related to the customers. And this information is publicly available, okay? And then what we want to really understand is how, remember in supply chain network design, you need to pay attention to the demand. We are talking about the demand. You need to pay attention, sec second point, to the capacity and of course to the locations. Right, and that's exactly what we are doing here. And then we are paying attention to how much of these produced items can be grown locally or are sold directly to the government. But it's not only wet and rice anymore. Now we are adding plenty of millets, pulses, etc., that I'm going to show in a moment. And of course, related to the constraints, well, the first two taste preference and demand constraint. Well, we need to guarantee that we are meeting the demand, supply constraint, and flow balance constraint. We need to make sure that we are like acquiring, procuring the product and bringing it uh, to the hands of the end consumer up to here. And then we need to make sure that we are respecting the capacity of each of the different facilities, okay? That's pretty much it. And I didn't write down here like the domain constraints, but remember that they need to be, you know, like also larger or equal than zero, okay? So now the results, and this is where we started using plenty of AI, right? Uh, especially machine learning. So clustering analysis. First, we define like how many clusters we really needed, right? Especially for the food baskets. And then we started, you know, like using this elbow method just to make sure that we were like with a value lower or equal than the AGM value equal to one. And this is a value of six typically. So then we started building the clusters for the consumers. Do you remember that? Based on the region, based on the, their uh, socioeconomic features, et cetera. And then we started paying particular attention to what they were consuming in each of the different regions, you know, uh, or by each of the different clusters. And something that you immediately realize is that there are some peaks or maximums that are rich. For, for instance, this cluster is eating a lot of small millets, right? And the biggest cereal that they are consuming is actually rice, okay? Um, well, this cluster is completely different. It's a little bit more steady, right? In the maximum that they are consuming and the peaks are at these different lentils that they have, monk, ort, and besan. All of these lentils are like pulses, right? Or beans that they have there. And those are different types of um, uh, plant-based protein, okay? So once we characterize like the people that we have here and also like the clusters of food that we have, 
we needed to understand like how many clusters of food baskets we needed, right? So we defined six of them, and this is like the big summary. As you can see, like the vast majority of the content is rice and wet. We want to preserve that. It has work, it's bringing nutrition to the, to the inhabitants there and the population, but we also want to make sure that we are bringing something else. And this something else is plant-based protein that is locally grown, okay? And then this is exactly what we started bringing. So in the case of cluster number six, for instance, we have uh, around 18% uh, of rice wet. Uh, it's around like 52% uh, uh, more or less or 50%. Then we are bringing our heart, that is these poles that we have here, the, the one in, in, in yellow. Then we have a uh, jowar and then we have bashra, okay? And these are the ones that are bringing like a little bit more nutrition. And don't worry guys, it's just two more slides and we are gonna be ready for questions. So start writing your questions there guys, okay? And then, so probably the main question is, okay, perfect. So you already understood what is happening with the consumption and the demand. You already understood like how you can build these uh, different um, baskets, right? Based on the location and many other characteristics and the uh, nutritious content that they are bringing. But now how you are gonna distribute this? That's where the supply chain network design, the, the mathematical model, the optimization model that, that I showed you is gonna be playing an important role, okay? So this is the picture before our model. And well, for the ones who are not from India, this state that you see in red is the one that is, let's say, accumulating most or concentrating a lot of production and also distribution is called Punjab, okay? So you like Indian food, there is very good Punjabi, you know, like food, right? So, and this state is actually followed by others like this one, this one is called Uttar Pradesh, is one of the most, is the densest state in terms of population. We have others like this one that, he, oh, oh, I forgot this one, sorry. This is called uh, Haryana. Uh, that's where the national uh, capital region is located, where New Delhi is located. And um, this other state is called um, uh, Hyderabad, if I don't remember well. But as you can see, we're bringing all of these, but the procurement and the distribution happens at a lower scale, right? Uh, especially in states like Gujarat, that is this one here that is completely white and this one that is called Maharashtra. So, and Maharashtra is a state where the, the capital is Mumbai, okay? And this is a small state here that is called Goa. So in other words, we are not necessarily bringing like the quantities that the, the, these states need. So when we run our model, including not only rice and wet, but also other protein-based uh, pulses, look at this. So we were able to balance this a little bit more, okay? And I know that several of you would say like, okay, uh, that's great. Now we can see that Punjab is a little bit more balanced. So you were able to increase like what you are bringing to, to Uttar Pradesh because we went from this um, light, this light green that you see here to this yellow that is here. So we are bringing a little bit more proportion. And the reason why this is happening is because what I already told you is one of the densest states. So we need to bring more to this population and by the way, it's one of the poorest um, areas in terms of wealth as well in, 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 in India, right? So if you are wondering, okay, what, why, why this is happening, right? I'm not showing you like um, uh, ISO weather or ISO terms, you know, like a map. That's where you can see the weather and like the, also like the different climates inside the region. But most of this part is arid. This part has a little bit of a desert here as well. So that's one of the reasons why these states are not able like to produce their own uh, wet rice and other pulses, you know? So you need to make sure that the states that are a little bit more humid or have a, a better weather, I'm gonna be like bringing all of these products to the others, right? Particularly in the case of rice and wet. The other ones that are locally grown might be enough to, to, to suffice, you know, like the suffice, sorry, the part related to the uh, plant-based protein. So um, just last comment here. We're also bringing uh, food to, 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 to this state as well, that is called Assam, if I remember well. And the ones that you see in white are those states that are under dispute, okay, with other countries. I'm not gonna talk about politics, but our model can start bringing, you know, like, you know, like also food to those. It's just that by, we put these constraints by requirement of, of some, some colleagues, okay? So let me summarize what you just learned today about like the study. So number one, how we answer the first research question, how we design this healthy, affordable uh, basket. So we are actually capitalizing on the fact that we are locally growing pulses in different parts of India. 
And we want to make sure that we create these or we use these artificial intelligence approaches to create these baskets via clustering uh, based on local taste preferences and also how much the, the agronomy there is helping, you know, like to put these into these products into these baskets as a cost efficient, uh, as a cost efficient strategy. Second, how we are like bringing all of these to the rest of the of the population population by using the public distribution system that I told you, but making a few changes, you know, part of the things that we want to start doing is to reduce the number of intermediaries and make sure that we are able to move on with other stuff as well. Okay, so um, in order to wrap up here, so hopefully you like this idea, but I want to finish giving you like four last messages. Number one, improving the food supply chains is very important because as you saw, this is the minimum that you can do to improve the productivity and the economics of a country. Second, there is a huge opportunity to start thinking about supply chains, not only as a supply chain management based oriented stuff. You need to start like understanding how other disciplines like nutrition, et cetera, can start, you know, like helping create other type of schemes that might be useful to intervene, to change that typical approach. So, because at the end, this is the third point. If you want to really create long-term sustainable food ecosystems, you need to uh, look for holistic solutions. It's not only the supply chain management based one that is gonna be uh, the, the only one that you should follow. You need to pay attention to the other ones. And last but not least, we are not, let's say, paying too much attention here to what Kiranas, that is mom and pop stores or nano stores as we call them, can do. But it's important to start developing this small to small business environments in order to support the delivery of goods, right? Otherwise it's gonna be insufficient to reach out to the last, you know, like a location that is very isolated in a particular place in India or in any anywhere in the world, okay? And of course, well, this work wouldn't be possible without all my team and particularly the help of Sanchita Das, she's Sanchita from West Bengal and my colleague Tatiana Sadala Kolesi, who is actually our nutritionist. Those were the ones who changed my chip and made me realize that, yeah, we're committing a mistake if we are using the diet problem, okay? So that's pretty much it. So um, I would like to pass the word to you, Laura and Kellen, probably to listen a few of the questions from the from the audience. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that this last slide as well, because we have a lot of questions asking where to find this research, if you have any papers, publications, or any information to share. So everyone here in the audience, if you're interested, please contact Chris Mejia or go to the website from the Food and Retail Operation Lab to find out more on the details of the project. And of course, you have the video uh, recording in YouTube at the MIT CTL channel. Um, so personally, I felt it was impactful um, because you showed us the huge impact for ma food malnutrition uh, can have in many different aspects. And sometimes like we've got all these tools and you have seen like you have when you actually went through all our program, I would say, uh, with the different tools you have used. And we, we learned about these tools, but probably we didn't think of applying it in a way that you did and how you combined all those elements. And knowing that we can make such an impact by using things that we get access to, probably in a smaller scale, but I think it's also uh, insightful and inspiring for our audience. And based on the comments and the emojis I'm seeing popping up in the screen, I hope that everyone else felt the same way. Um, so there are many questions, uh, but I will start with one about uh, data preparations because we, we are talking about multimodal uh, logistics, including road and rail. You're talking about the complexities of politics and regulations. Uh, we, we got the government uh, intervention here. Um, you're talking about local sourcing, about the different types of food that are produced um, and how those help with nutrition. What was the most challenging part of working with all this information, combining, preparing it, and like a little bit on the data management process you did? Yeah, this is a great question. Thank you, Laura. I, I would say that probably the hardest part is not to, to actually process the data. I think that that's kind of easy, but to find the data, you know? And I think that that's something that uh, you will face in your daily lives guys as well. Um, so you need to make sure that you have like some kind of a framework that is useful for you to, you know, like uh, look at the right ways and the right, you know, like uh, sources to find this out. So at the beginning with Sanchita, Sanchita had this very clear, right? So she told me, I know that this expenditure 
uh, this consumption expenditure data exist. Also, these records about like how much crops and the yield is, but it's quite fragmented, right? So once we found that, we were we needed to process and to put this together. So probably that was like the challenging part. But thinking about like the future, especially for the the learners and the micro master credential holders, I would say that what I was telling you is true and holds. You need to find or create a framework for you to be resilient and say like, what would it happen if I'm not able to find certain data? So uh, my recommendation there would be like, try to uh, categorize or classify the data depending on the urgency and the importance, right? And also how much granularity you need for that data. Because the, the preliminary model of this, by the way, was uh, with hypothetical data, right? And then we started, you know, like uh, improving it as as we move on, and we started looking for okay, let's look for data related to nutrition. What type of data is available? What we can do? Because originally, if I tell you the truth, we wanted to include like micronutrients, micronutrients, you know, like uh, vitamin D, vitamin A, mineral zinc, blah blah blah. So the nutritionist Tatiana told us, no, no, it's not a good idea. You need to go for micronutrients, right? because, um, and, and that's easier to get in terms of data, right? And that's in terms of data. Now in terms of modeling, because I typically like divide my, my advice on that this, this way. So in terms of modeling, I think that the challenging part was uh, to put everything together. As you can see, there are like three different things here, two of them AI-based, and despite optimization, uh, now is kind of starting being considered AI as well. Well, we put it like in another bucket, right? So put these things together was challenging, but we found a way through, you know, like a lot of resilience and making sure that whatever we were getting at the beginning was were gonna be parameters for the optimization model. And last but not least, um, the, 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 the lesson learned is like, you need to gain a lot of resilience as you move on with these models. You need to make sure to make some sacrifices because sometimes the perfect model is not gonna be possible. So you need to make sure to be, you know, like, open to say like, I want to make sure that I get this. This is the objective of my research, but, and this is how I plan to help the, the humankind. So, and this is what we did here. We didn't want to deep dive too much into nutrition components or like technicalities and be more practical. That that would be my take, uh, Laura. Awesome, well, thank you. Chris, I definitely would echo um, Laura's comments on how it's kind of inspiring to see the application of some of these tools that we learn, you know, along the way, you know, some machine learning and operations research and some of these tools that we learn and maybe kind of a more of an academic um, context being applied to kind of really important problems like food, nutrition, you know, I know that's a, been a problem kind of all, probably all of human history, but and it's still a problem, you know, with conflict around the world, increasing some of that in certain regions and other regions going through, you know, drought and deserts, um, desertification and all those kinds of things and climate change in the future, probably bringing even more of that in the future. So I'm um, super inspiring to see that. Um, I want to maybe dive in, kind of build on your comment about the data and dive a little bit more into the customer segmentation. I think it's kind of fascinating to be able to have that level of data for a huge um, region of the world like that. And so maybe if you could elaborate a little bit further on how that um, clustering process worked and maybe what were, what were some of the kind of key features of the data that differentiate those different customers? You know, I know you had geography in there and, yeah. you know, agriculture and all those kinds of things. What were kind of the key features that separated those clusters into distinct clusters? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it's, that's a very interesting question. So in short, um, I would dare to say that in terms of like the main differentiators were probably like the uh, average income level. I would say, and the regions that they were living at, okay? And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because uh, the region where you live at, it determines because of the weather, what you're gonna have available in terms of like the pulses and the millions. And how much money you have is gonna provide the affordability. So again, it's accessibility and affordability, right? Price and and, and the location of where is this uh, being, 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 being done. But there was a third factor that for me was quite interesting and is the yield that the yield of the of the of the crops of course how much you can grow and it's in terms of capacity so you are it's like a news vendor inventory model right so if you are over the capacity or under the capacity so how you want to handle this so if you are under and you don't have enough capacity to meet your demand you need to start looking for other let's say states to or like districts to provide you this right 
But in exchange, you need to like provide the poles or the millet that you have. So that's that's what we found. But this is just to 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 say like what were the determinants or the significant factors. The process was the following. Uh, as I mentioned in the methodology, we started with the clustering, right? We really needed to understand like through K means because all of this data was uh, quantitative. In case that you want to use qualitative, you will need to use a uh, K modes, or you want to use like mixed, you need K prototypes, right? You know, quantitative and qualitative. We use K means because all the data was quantitative. And then we determined like uh, that we needed six clusters, six different baskets. And then we started feeding, you know, like this information. But before we went into the feeding the information and anal analyzing it, we said like, oh, wait, we need to understand what are the drivers. That's why we use the principal component analysis just to determine like what are the factors where we need to pay attention to and what not to. Because if two different, let's say, variables were in the same direction, were parallel, you know, those ones, just if you just take one, that would be more than enough. And technically speaking, they are correlated, right? So you, do, you just need to pay attention to one to avoid multicollinearity as well in the future to inflate too much certain variable. And then after we did this PCA analysis, that's where we started saying like, okay, these are like the characteristics. These are like the features that the consumers should have. And now we started saying like, okay, this is for the customers or the consumers, the households, and the other part should be for the products. And that's where we started paying attention to the yield, to the other characteristics in order to build the, the, the food baskets or the grain baskets, you know? And then the process were, was more or less the same, but in the part of the food baskets or the grain baskets, we needed to use um, uh, optimization too, because the combination and the quantity of, you know, the combinatorials there are astronomic. You, you, you can put like as many pulses as you want, even if, if it's in a small amount. So we needed to make sure that we were actually receiving a good benefit to include that in the knapsack, right? In the bin, the basket, in order to, to drive it. But there are so many interesting problems that can be improved uh, based on that. Thank you, Chris. And you make it sound a little bit too simple because people here is all willing to start implementing their own models or start oh. or getting into a startup to help with food malnutrition. So definitely again uh, into the inspiring side of the supply chain, which I think it's what we are also all passionate about. Um, just going back into this, thinking on how can I apply something like this? Um, I was wondering if you thought or could try to extend this to a different city around uh, the world, different countries, larger scales or same or smaller ones, um, different retail formats. And we were wondering if you were exploring that approach, if you uh, had anything you want to share in terms of that. Yeah, I will be brief this time for the sake of time too, right? <laughs> in order to allow the other questions. So in short, yes, we are expanding the, the this project into other areas. However, as you probably know, in life, nothing resembles or is exactly the same. So we need to change like many of the things that we were doing here. Probably the framework that I explained to you as the methodology is going to be similar, but uh, the, the culture, uh, the preferences, the intake, the products are going to be completely different. So at the moment, we're exploring like how to use a similar approach into fruits and vegetables. Okay. Uh, first, in India, we are very interested in start work in, in, in actually we're already working with bananas, a little bit with mangoes, things like that, you know, especially for the lassies, if you like them. Right. Um, uh, and we are bringing like these learnings also to Latin America and, 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 and uh, hopefully soon to, uh, to Africa, just to make sure that we use similar concepts. But something that actually intrigues us a lot, and, and I mentioned this uh, at some point in the talk, is like these retail formats that you mentioned, Laura, for instance, the Kiranas or the Nano stores, the mom and pop stores, they can play an important role. And we should not take them out of the other systems. This one in particular, we are using it as it is because the public distribution system managed by the food corporations, that's the institution that managed this in India, is already there, right? Uh, and we are just supplementing or suggesting what they should do in order to improve like the delivery, right? But if we think about like how we really want to penetrate, to go to the isolated communities where the most vulnerable populations are located, we need more capillarity. And the capillarity is going to be brought by these mom and pop stores. There are the small family-owned retailers that know the community, et cetera. And they know the business. They have a curated assortment, et cetera. So that's, that's what we have been working 
for already uh, more than 10 years, you know? So, and, and we are now bringing just the, the, the full malnutrition component in order to, to combat that. And just to wrap up, in your first question, you also mentioned like the political part. Yeah, politics, that's another thing that we need to, to pay attention to because even if the model is perfect and yeah, we need to take into account what is happening in terms of like where the model should be working. Otherwise you need to consider other constraints and other things to, to make it work, okay? Awesome. Thank you, Chris. That sounds like a challenging constraint to apply to a model is the political is. map within a particular area for sure. So, mm -hmm. um, awesome. so we have lots of great questions in the, the Q&A. Thank you for bringing those and keep thinking of those. And we'll start pulling questions from that Q&A. Maybe before we do, while well, we kind of curate some of those questions, um, Chris, I don't know if you have any just kind of general comments for our MicroMasters learners or maybe learners who are thinking about the GC log program, if you have any kind of recommendations or ideas for them as they're as they are along their journey and what their next steps might be? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, I'm gonna just do this very quickly. I, I actually prepared like a slide related to this such that the MicroMaster credential holders or the learners, if they want to know more about it. In short, the MicroMasters in supply chain management and the GCLO program, the graduate certificate in logistics and supply chain management, now we have this pathway that is more professionalizing, right guys? So in case that you are interested into coming to MIT during three weeks in July, three weeks in January with a capstone project in between, well, this is your call, right? So we are offering this waiver uh, to the to the MicroMaster credential holders. And hopefully I'm gonna be able to see a few of you or all of you in the future, right? So this is like another way to come to, to MIT is not the blended master's program. That's like a, a, another pathway, right? In case that you want to follow that part. This one is the GCLO program is like a glimpse of uh, the experience that you might have, you know, at, at MIT. But um, it might help you a lot, you know, like to deep dive in many, many concepts and to understand how to drive them into practice because our motto is actually related to uh, how we can, you know, like shape the future of supply chain management in emerging market economies. Right. And I see that many of you are like living in those countries. And for those who live in developed countries, uh, maybe you are working for DHL, maybe you are working for PNG. Many of your companies are also serving emerging market economies. So it, it might be also interesting for you to see what you what you need to, you know, like understand and how these uh, countries are different from developed uh, regions, too. OK, so that that would be my invitation. Uh, thank you, Kellen. Awesome, Chris. Yeah, I'm sure many credential holders here or joining us in the future will be taking that pathway because it gives you the opportunity to actually do all this research research together with Chris Mejia and his team and uh, support your community, which is also part of what we're talking about in terms of making a change, a change, an impact in the world. Um, so let's launch the last poll to learn um, a little bit about what was the audience learning about today. What's is, that they found most interesting. And in the meantime, I want to bring a question from Gavin uh, here in the audience. I hope I pronounced that well. Um, so Gavin is saying, of course, like as you mentioned, adding more uh, constraints or more elements to a model sometimes make it uh, either delay a little bit too longer than we need or just a little bit too complex to solve. Um, but they are asking about what could be the sustainability controls that you could add to a model like this? Just thinking on maximizing the use of cleaner transportation methods, yeah. or if you think that solving the malnutrition um, issue is only given like an indirect uh, solution for the sustainability. No, great question. So I didn't deep dive into the nutrition part, but hopefully you get it how we are handling it, right? But uh, so to, to answer the question in short, so uh, implicitly, we are also reducing the empty returns of some of the of the vehicles, right? And uh, of the trucks that we have there. However, this can be expanded into a, a, a into a criterion or into a, an objective function that we can add to the model just to make sure that we are minimizing the CO2 emissions, for instance, right? Or on the other hand, we can also pay a, a little bit more attention. This one is a little bit more difficult to model, though, to the uh, to you know like the coverage that the food that we are bringing into certain communities, uh, and and this coverage how this is being like approached, you know, because it would be very easy for us to say like I'm satisfying this percent of the demand based on different product categories, right? Or perhaps macronutrients. That's easy to do, but 
again, the granularity of the data might not be enough. That's a limitation, right? But if we really want to do like a change uh, and a change of paradigm on how to model this, I would go for something that really, um, uh, you know, like uh, affects people and is like the employment that it generates or the uh, effects that malnutrition produces on them, you know, unemployment, lack of productivity, et cetera. And there are so many other things, like without being so philosophical, you can also model like how you can uh, actually balance many of these different uh, deliveries uh, in, in different population segments, right? So who, who is like being employed out of this? Who is like receiving the benefit out of this? So in short, coverage metrics, inequality metrics, uh, CO2 emissions, uh, things like that. And that, that would be like part of what we can do. You can also pay attention to how much you are using your facilities to, to you know, like make sure that the space is being occupied properly. Or even better, what we are doing at the moment is uh, accounting how much food waste is generated if this is not delivered properly and on time. That's called the perishability problem that we are modeling currently with one of my postdocs here, Mauricio Gamas. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. And I see a couple of hands up there. So maybe if you could put your questions there in the Q&A and we'll try to try to look at those in the Q&A there um, instead of raising your hand there. But I want to maybe build on, there's a couple of questions related to that specific last comment you made about perishability. That seems to be a, a you know, that seems to be a very significant challenge with food related research. Um, yeah. So one of the questions was, how does the current model, the research that you presented, did it take into account perishability of those different grains and pulses? And then another question um, to build off that from Amrinder is, that their comment was that in Punjab, a lot of food goes to waste because it's siloed or I guess it's stored yeah. maybe perhaps for longer than past that expiration point, if yeah. you will. So how did that model um, take into account that challenge there? Yeah, this is this is a very a very good couple of questions. So number one, the perishability was considered into the model, but basically what we did is pre-processing this. So in case that some of the products were not going to be edible for consumption, they were not shipped, right? But we didn't quantify as part of this particular project the food waste generated out of this. Okay. So I think that this answers like both of the questions in short. But let me elaborate a little bit more on what we are doing right now with other models, not with this one. Okay. So we are quantifying perishability as the uh, remaining shelf lifetime of the of the products, the remaining days that a particular product has before it expires, okay, or it perishes. Naturally, what we want to do is to make sure that this keeps this arrives to the hands of the of the person as soon as possible. But something that we are inserting at the moment is like how we can expand or extend the, the shelf life of a particular product. We can freeze it, we can cook it, we can do something else. We can liophilize it, uh, transform it into powder. So that's part of the things that are now part of the circular economy approaches that we are inserting. So that's how we are extending perishability. And last comment there. So in terms of like how we can quantify the, the, the perishability of certain products inside the facilities, this particular model uh, quantify it, but I didn't show like the, like the numbers there. Uh, but given that these are grains, most of the grains have long life, okay? So the problem there is actually the plagues, okay? If you see some type of beetles, that's, that's the part that we need to manage and that's part of the food safety approach. We, I'm not going to elaborate too much on that because that's part of another question, but um, that's something that we need to control using other stuff. But in terms of quantifying this, um, I have a couple of current students working on that, uh, one of them working for a big retail company. And what we have found is that for very perishable products like berries, uh, the put away times and not necessarily the storing time is the one that affects everything. So you are not able to coordinate everything synchronously, you know, like on time, you are not going to be able to have um, what is called just-in-time approaches in order to reduce the inventory, big to zero approaches. It's impressive to think on the many extensions this research can oh, yeah. have and oh. the many aspects that you're touching every time you talk about any single point of it. And Teddy brought another one here in the audience. Um, Thinking on this extension of your future research, you talk about the possibility of reducing the number of intermediate parties mm -hmm. uh, in the supply chain. Uh, so they are asking whether you could consider working with someone uh, or some organization or, or what is the plan in terms of 
um, not having jobs lost, like the people affected by the reduced number of intermediate parties. Um, how, how do you approach such kind of, of impacts? Yeah, we, we actually, we already did it in Brazil. We approached to a, to a let's say, e-commerce company that was bringing uh, fruits and vegetables to the small restaurants. And we told them like, let's bring this to the mom and pop stores, to the Kiranas, to the, you know, like the nano stores as we call them. And we start shipping them. So in short, the answer is we have already done it. I would love to discuss with the person who is interested in doing that, because what we are doing is like, um, we are trying to create a direct to consumer channel without killing the other ones, right? So it depends. And But particularly no, not every type of consumer, especially like the vulnerable population segment consumers, you know? Those are the ones who really need to have access to these low cost, affordable things. And the only way to do it is like by reducing the number of touches across the supply chain. And if you have like the community of farmers living outside the city, whatever city it is, right? We did this in Rio, Rio Grande, in Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. That is one of the biggest states. It's the southest state uh, there. Uh, and, and we were able actually to coordinate through this uh, company that is called Suma App, you know, uh, to collaborate with these aso uh, farmer associations and make sure that they were delivering a small to a small, a small holder farmer to a small retailer. And that's how we, we have made it happen. But I would love to, you know, like discuss more with whoever is interested because this reduces the, the, the waste, reduces the inventory. But at the same time, I need to be fair. You are also increasing the risk for the small players. So the, that's why it's very important to coordinate this properly with uh, some involvement from other parties. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Well, maybe well, before we go to our next question, if we could end our poll here, maybe we'll just take a look, quick look at our results from our, our second poll here. And the question was, you know, what was the most interesting part of today's session? We just kind of wanted to kind of get some feedback on what you got out of today's session. I'm just looking at the results here. It looks like the most popular option was gaining a new perspective on supply chain challenges and the potential to use these tools. I definitely you know, resonates with me as well. You know, these tools that we learn in, in more of an academic context to see them applied to kind of a really important real world problem is awesome. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you have any thoughts on those poll results there. Oh, that, that makes sense. I'm happy to know that you are finding like ways to, you know, like use what you learn today to your daily life. I think that that's the most important goal with any of these live events. So this is great. And the fact that I see that, put a seed into your knowledge about food supply chains is also gratifying and uh, rewarding to know. Awesome, thank you. So we have maybe two couple of minutes left here. It's so maybe time for kind of one more quick um, question. This is also just kind of a question on that the current project that you presented and the, the research you presented, um, looking at the production levels. And so there's a couple of questions that I'm gonna to tie together here. One from Marco, his question was, was the constraint in the model, was the overall production the same or did the overall production within the region increase or decrease? So that's kind of one question related to the modeling. And the right. second question was how the climates of the various regions were taken into account. And that, to me, that sounds like the capacities within each of the regions, yeah. but maybe you would elaborate on that a little. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, actually, the two questions are related, right? So number one, naturally, like the uh, yield, that is the crop capacity to keep harvesting, you know, like that you go and harvest this out of the land uh, is different depending on the region, right? So if I go to an arid or like a desertic area, you're not going to have like the same yield, right? So that's the way that we consider it because the crop yield information that is actually collected by the government is already reflected there. Uh, we could have done though, uh, more, you know, like research in terms of a scenario analysis, what would have happened if the climate change impacts this, reduces that, this or that. And by the way, we are currently like preparing uh, a manuscript to submit this to uh, an important journal. So probably if Sanchita is somewhere there, otherwise I will let her know all the feedback. That's something that we can do, okay? So now in terms of the, produ the productivity or the production, how we consider this was this a steady? No, this was different, right? Uh, depending on the region too, because there are regions that based on their characteristics, not only now on, on the weather condition, but also on other topics related to the um, infrastructure maturity level or like the accessibility to water, the accessibility to credit, certifications, things like that, they show a different productivity. So naturally this was different depending on the regions. Again, coming back to the point of the scenario analysis, Probably we can play a little bit with that in order to see what would be the effect if the west or the south or the north, you know, like regions like that in India, 
would have a more uh, a more let's say a visible impact in case that we change the the productivity the yield or any of the characteristics even the demand you know Thank you, Chris. And we are over the hour. Thanks, everyone, for staying with us and learning about uh, food uh, and retail operation lab work. Uh, we are excited to having hosted you, Chris, and we hope to see you again. We know that there is so much more we would love to learn from you. Uh, so I'm sure the audience here is clubbing for you, which means that they are also interested in on joining oh, us nice. again. Um, thank you very much. We're very happy to share also all the questions that remain in the Q&A feature because there are so many questions we didn't get to answer in case those are helpful for you and Sanchita and Tatiani. Yes. And um, yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, any final words to our audience you want to share? Well, just to thank everyone for, you know, your patience to be here with us today. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy that I provided, as we say in the, in the, in the team, some food for thought. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kellen. Always happy to co-host with you. Thank you, Lara. Pleasure and always a pleasure um, to co-host with you. And thank you, Chris, for your time. And thank you, everyone, for your participation today. Awesome. And everyone, stay tuned for the upcoming webinar in the series. The last one is coming soon. And I hope to continue seeing you around the MicroMasters program. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.